I think it's at least two weeks that we have been working on object detectors and we started with uh, two stage detectors. So you needed two stage. The first stage was the region proposal network. So it was proposing you regions. And then the next stage is using a convolutional run network to classify the object and adjust the bounding box around that proposal using a regression. So the region proposal network was taking an image. It had a bunch of anchor, uh, anchor boxes, and we were using those anchor boxes to give us an objectness score. Is there an object inside this anchor or no? And adjust the anchor. So you always had a frame of reference, even for your region proposal network. So it was to a stage. You had a region proposal network, and then you have your detector. That's going to do the detection for you. Now the question is, wouldn't it be more efficient if you combine the two, combine the region proposal network and uh, the detector network and do it in one pass? Would it be more efficient? And if it is more efficient, is it worth it? How much accuracy you're losing by doing so? Because we know that the current state of the art for object detectors are these two stage detectors. You first propose a region and then you focus on that region to do your classification and bounding box regression. The question is, can we do both at the same time? And that's when you're going to have one stage detectors. And then I'm going to start with overfeed. This is one of the first papers. It's actually 2013. So it's right after AlexNet that is trying to address that problem, in particular object detection. And uh, they're going to use a unified framework to do recognition, basically classification, localization, and detection. Let's start with a classification task. So the network is very similar to AlexNet. So it's exactly the same network, practically speaking. So let's go through it. In layer one, you have convolution and max pooling. Your filter size was seven by seven. Your convolution stride is two by two. You have pooling size and then pooling stride. So whenever you're doing stride, you're down sampling. So your features are gonna have a lower resolution compared to your original image. Then you go here, you have that fetal size, you have the pooling size, and then you do another stride. So you're down sampling and you have a bunch of other convolutions. And then uh, you have a three by three striding in the end as well. So in the end, you're going to end up before your fully connected network with uh, a total subsampling ratio of 36. So it's going to be two times three times two times three. And we know that when we were investigating AlexNet, that uh, to report better accuracy on your classification, they were taking 10 regions during inference of the image top uh, right corner, top left corner, bottom left, bottom right, and the center, this is gonna give you five. And then once you rotate your image, it's gonna be the same object inside the rotated image. That's gonna give you five more. And you had 10 regions and you were pushing your these 10 regions through your network and then voting. All of those 10 predictions in the end are gonna vote which class you're gonna use. And it's just a simple average of the probabilities. So to improve the accuracy, that was what AlexNet was doing during inference. That's only 10 regions, 10 crops of your image that you're pushing through your network. This paper came along and said you can actually do more of that. And you can actually have multiple scales for your image. Let's say you have six scales for the image. And these are the input sizes of your image. So you can uh, have different scales for the inputs to your network. And then in the end, you want to end up with more classes for you to be able to vote. This is going to give you nine classes, three times three. Don't worry about the details. I'm going to go through it. But the first one is going to give you nine classes, nine predictions. This is going to give you six times nine, nine times 15. And then when you add them up, you're going to end up with a lot of predictions. And you want to do it in a smart way and in an, in an efficient way. And once you have these many predictions out of a single image, you can just average them out. And then that's going to give you a better classification score. So that's the idea 
but how do you achieve that? So I'm highlighting a bunch of numbers here that are important, and then we are gonna go through each one of them. The first one is you take an image, let's say at a scale two, you take an image, and once you push it through your convolutions, and right before layer five, you stop, you're gonna end up with uh, a feature map that has these many pixels, 20 times 23. And we know that this is gonna be different depending on the scales of the image that is being inputted. So that's pre-pulling. Now we want to do our pulling. And where is this number six coming from? And what does that mean? And what, is the, what are these three by three? What you can do is that when you look at this total subsampling ratio, it's too big. You want to have a smaller subsampling ratio. And if there was a way to divide this by three, then you would end up with 12 subsampling for your subsampling ratio. So that's where this three is coming from. But how can we divide that? You take your input, which has, in this case, let's only look at the X coordinate. Let's not worry about the Y coordinate. It's gonna be the same arguments. So you're gonna end up with uh, 20 numbers here. That's the resolution before pulling for layer five. Then what you do is you, you're you gonna have uh, slides of delta to the right. The first one is you don't slide your filter at all. The first one, you slide it one pixel to the right. The third one, you slide it two pixels to the right. And that's where this three is coming from because you have three deltas on your image. And the other three is coming from this being a two dimensional object. But now we are only analyzing a single dimension. Okay, now you do your pulling. You pull these three numbers and you put it here. That's the red, that corresponds to the delta being zero. You pull these three numbers and you put them here. And then in the end, you're gonna end up with six numbers per each color. That's after pulling. And that's what you get here. That's the six. Now you understand all of these numbers. 20 is the resolution before pulling. This is the resolution after pulling. And then because you have three deltas, you're gonna end up with three here. The rest of it is uh, taking these uh, features and pushing them through your fully connected network. But we know that the fully connected network needs a resolution of five by five, because then you're gonna flatten it and then it's gonna have the correct dimension for you to push it through your fully connected network. So it's gonna do uh, it's going to have the resolution of five by five. It needs that. It's a requirement. It means that you are taking one, two, three, four, five, and that's going to basically you take these first five numbers and you push that through your fully connected network. That's going to give you one number here. And then you take the rest of it, the rest of the five, and that's going to give you a second number. So that's where the two is coming from. So after pushing it through the fully connected, you're gonna end up with two numbers. In the other dimension, you're gonna end up with three numbers, but let's focus on the first one. So now what you do is you take this number, multiply that by three, two times three is gonna give you a six. And th these are the six values that you see here. And these are six times the number of classes that you had. For the other dimension, you have nine of them. In the end, you're gonna get six times nine predictions. So now what happened to the total subsampling ratio after all of these operations? Because of these deltas, you had three of them, you managed to reduce the total subsampling ratio to be 12 rather than 36. Now the cool thing is that your network is looking at multiple scales for your image, and each one is not being too much subsampled. And in the end, you're gonna end up with a lot of predictions that you can uh, use them to vote what's going to be the last prediction of the network after all of the voting is done. Now you might wonder, AlexNet takes as input 221 by 221 inputs. That's the input to the AlexNet, the input resolution. Where is this 245 coming from? That's coming from 221 plus 2 times 12. And 12 is your subsampling ratio. So that's why the first scale is 245 by 245. That's your entire image. And this 12 is coming from uh, these uh, delta shifts that are happening in your network. So is everything clear for the classification part? That's the recognition part. Okay, so far so good. And I like the fact that you are saying it 
it makes sense so far because we want to do localization and detection in the end. So at this point in the paper, you have a very good feature extractor and that's called overfit. And you're gonna hear this word a lot when you're reading papers, you're gonna hear a lot about this paper. So it was a very influential paper when it came out. Uh, so what about localization? First of all, we know that convolutions are really efficient when it comes to a sliding window. You take a window and then you slide it because you are sharing a lot of computations. Let's take as an, let's take an example. If your input image is 4D by 14 by 14 and your convolution kernel is 5 by 5, you're going to end up with 10 by 10. Then you have your pooling. That's going to give you a resolution of 5 by 5. You have another convolution, then a bunch of one by one convolutions. And then in the end, you're going to end up with a single class. What we just saw and why this is efficient is that if you increase the resolution of your input, then the only additional cost are these yellow ones. So these are the additional cost compared to what you did before. The rest of it, the rest of it is being shared. And for this additional cost, you're going to end up with more classifiers. So Sarush has a question. I'm a little bit confused about the scales. Is this diagram happening on each scale? Uh, this diagram? Yes. So we just did it for scale two, which corresponded to 20. And then you had 20 before your unpooled map. Then yes, the same methodology is going to happen when you have a resolution of 17 or a 23 or a 29. So the same methodology. But in the end, whatever that's going to happen is that your subsampling ratio is going to be 12 compared to 36 because we are using three shifts. And the other question is, is this really efficient? And the answer is yes, because the only additional cost is going to be these two columns and two rows of your image. Okay, so far we were doing classification. Now let's fix uh, the feature extractor part of the network from this point up until this point. Let's keep the classifier. That's fine. It's doing the classification for us. We don't worry about that. Now we want to do the regression, bounding box regressions. So up until this point, we are going to fix the parameters. You're going to put a head for regression, and that's going to be a multitask learning. The first task was classification. The next one is regression. And let's create the head for the regression. And this figure, part A, corresponds to what you have here. It's a six by seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a six by seven uh, feature map. Don't worry about these 256 channels. I guess there is some typo in the paper. So don't worry about the number of channels. It's X number of channels. And then you have three by three shifts. So this is exactly what you have here. Now, rather than doing the classification part, we want to do the regression part. So you do your pooling, you're gonna end up with uh, six numbers, and that's gonna correspond to this six here. And uh, you're gonna have three by three shifts. And then the number of channels is very easy to change the number of channels. It's just a matrix multiplication of, in this case, 256 by 496. So that's the first layer in your regression. The second layer in the regression, you're just changing the dimensions. And then the last layer is going to output four channels, and they correspond to the top, left, bottom, and right coordinates of your box. And then this is going to be a per class regression. And then the rest of it is you just write down your L2 loss. You train this part of the network. This is the head of the network for regression. You do that. Now your classifier and regressor, they are sharing most of their parameters from this point up until this point, and then they depart into two heads. So this is going to give you a lot of boxes. So you're going to have a lot of boxes. We know that when you have a lot of boxes, our previous method was to do non-maximum separation. You can have an alternative method for merging these boxes together, and that's a greedy merge strategy. So what happens in the greedy search, your classifier head at different scales, scale one, two, three, four, five, six, is going to make its classification. And then you're going to pick the top K per each scale, top K classes. 
the ones that have the highest probability. They're gonna be in your CS. So that's a set of all of the classes. You're gonna have a bunch of bounding boxes. They correspond to those classes because we know that you have a per class bounding box predictor. So as soon as you choose your class, you're gonna pick the bounding box, the corresponding bounding box, and then you're gonna put it in your set BS. These are a bunch of coordinates. You create a union of all of them. That's gonna be your set B. And then the idea is that you want to merge them. You don't want to report all of these boxes. You want to report only a few of them. So how do you merge them? You're gonna define a match score between two boxes. And the match score is coming from the distance between the centers of two bounding boxes and the intersection areas of the boxes. And that's gonna tell you how good of a match are these two together. And then you want to find the ones that are not matching, that there is a very small match between the two. That's why you're finding the minimum of those two boxes. So you're gonna find two boxes that are matching the least and then forget about the stopping criteria. Then you merge them, you just merge the two boxes and the way that you merge it, you just compute the average of the box coordinates. That's how you merge them. You add the merged box to your set B and then you remove the two boxes that you started with. So you remove those two because you merged them together. And then the algorithm is gonna stop uh, as soon as this arc mean is bigger than the threshold. It means that you don't want to merge anymore. The match score otherwise is gonna be E. It means that all of your boxes, if the minimum is bigger than threshold, it means that all of those, any two boxes that you choose, they're gonna have a match score bigger than T it means that there is no reason to match them anymore. And that's when you're gonna stop. So I know this is a technical paper and it's actually a very hard read. So I highly encourage you guys to read that paper because it's written by Jan Lacun. So he knows what he is talking about, okay? So we are using a couple of features of convolutions. One is that convolutions are really efficient when you have a sliding window. The other one is the multi-scale. So I haven't seen this greedy merge being used in any other paper but I think it's a good idea to know about it. Um, and this, this greedy merge is a, it, it, it's an alternative to non-max suppression, right? It's an alternative for this paper or the method chosen by this paper. Okay. So otherwise the paper is not that complicated if you think about it. There is some transfer learning from your classifier. It's actually multitask learning. You have a classification head, you have the feature extractor, classifier part, regressor part, and then, uh, you need it to first, 36 was too big because you're gonna end up with huge uh, receptive fields and it's not gonna give you too many boxes to work with and it's not gonna give you too many classifiers. So you first have to do the subsampling. Therefore, you needed this trick of shifting your filters by one to their right. And then you had a regress and regressor network that's predicting four channels per each class. And then the rest of it is you come up with the training data, you know the ground truth bounding boxes, and then you do your regression. So is there any sense of uh, scoring the boxes here? Like there's no score assigned for a box, right? I think because this is per class, then you have your score. It's, it's the, the one that corresponds to the classifier part. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then another question I had is in these, uh, in these regression maps, um, what do these colors represent? So the first color is corresponding to the color that you have here. It's after your pulling. So you're going to have a filter of this size, and that's being multiplied by this, uh, I don't know what color that is. Let's call it orange, with the orange part. And then that's going to give you a number here. It's not actually a number. It's a vector of this language. So they correspond to the slide. The next one, you're going to slide it to the right by one. And then the last one is going to be the purple one is going to be this region. So that's what they correspond to. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. But then you see that there is no region proposal network anymore. 